What's up guys, what's growing on? So today, I'm in the middle of the urban jungle. I'm surrounded by highways, I'm very close to the city, and we're in downtown St. Pete. This is about an hour or so south of me, and something I'll point out, you know, St. Pete is happening. It's very trendy, there's lots of cool stuff going on here. The food movement is alive. Um, you know, it, there's a lot of urban farming going on, and I have to say, if I was to live in the city, I think St. Pete would be my first choice. Um, you know, I get a vibe here kind of like you would get in California. Um, you know, they're very proactive, they're very ahead of the ball, kind of ahead of the curve over here. So, lots of cool, neat stuff happening on here on this site. And I'm gonna take you guys around and show you, so hold tight. All right, guys, who's ready for a tour of this epic urban farm? Um, you know, lots of volunteers working here, lots of people coming in and helping on a regular basis, and something I wanna warn you guys about, they are doing a lot of work here right now. Some things have changed, some things are moving around. They used to have chickens, um, they used to have bees, those are gone, I think they still have some rabbits. I know the chickens are coming back, but some of that stuff's not here at the moment, so it's mostly gonna be garden and fruit trees, food forest, but I got Lev ready to give you guys a tour, so hold tight. Good morning. Good morning. At? Welcome to the Living and Learning Laboratory at St. Pete Eco Village. Come on in. So who are you? What do you do here? My name is Lev and I'm the garden manager here. Uh, one of the first garden managers with paid positions in uh, Pinellas County actually. So it's pretty exciting. We're starting to, this is kind of a hub and we're trying to create a more connection networking with all the community gardens in the area and create a little bit of an infrastructure so that the community gardens as they get going, you know, they don't, um, when the volunteers move on or whatever, they don't kind of fizzle out. So we're trying to create a stronger uh, community garden network here and lead by example and showcase what is possible when you have a little bit of a committed staff and community support uh, for your community gardens. like a little portal into a, at the very least a 15 degree cooler world wow. <laughs> a more magical world yeah so I love I love our little food forest and the idea is to get this food forest to spread out and to have show people you know what's possible in, in two years and three years and four years this food forest this is about seven eight years now of uh, we got loquat we got tamarind moringa several different kinds of mangoes these avocados Walk through some avocados. Ooh. Got seven old pumpkins growing here in the understory. Starting to become a little traffic hazard. Mulberries, so you know we got all of our little layers. We got the, the tree canopy that we're trying to keep. This year we did a lot of trimming because we're trying to keep it um, manageable and harvestable. And we got our everbearing mulberry, longan. Not sure what happened this year. We had a lot of longans on there and then uh, they just all fell off one day. Got a lot of new green growth, but um, I'm I'm thinking with all the rain we've had, something something wasn't sitting right with the longan. Got a wild orange here. <clears throat> See little pineapples growing in the understory. Little baby mango coming in. We're trying to keep the the whole uh, food forest kind of ethic going. And that's what the kids love too. They come through here and you know they haven't we have a lot of youth programs coming through. That's what we're trying to uh, teach the kids. That's why we call it the living and learning laboratory. So hopefully the next generation like I grew up I don't even know what where food grew. I knew farms and that's it, you know, cow and old McDonald had a farm. Yeah. So I'm trying to show people we're trying to show people, you know, a little bit make it a little bit more interactive and engaging. I like it. Yeah. So you guys used to have some animal integration, I think a little bit of construction going on, changing around right now? Yeah, exactly. We had 60 chickens and then uh, the city kind of came down on us. We could only have 10 for code. So then we were like, okay, we can't really be a production farm. And we were really trying to uh, produce, work a lot of the land here. So we kind of pivoted and switched direction to be more of an educational, urban ag educational, sort of like an institute. And that's where we're moving forward now is to be a, a green business incubator, 
show people you know how to run a nursery uh, go to market with your plants show people how to do value-added products we have a solar dryer you know how to grow your tea dry your tea for example um, so different things that we've had success with in the past just showing people what's possible because a lot of a lot of people don't you know it's not in your high school career class like oh yeah work out at urban ag you know thing so we got to show people what's possible As many people, probably almost everybody in Florida, we have a lot of nematode issues. The nematodes, little worms in the ground that are, they like to uh, make homes in the roots of the plants and then they'll end up just really sapping the vitality and the vigor of the plants. So cowpeas are something that we're realizing grows great in Florida in the summer and it, uh, there are certain ones are resistant to nematodes. So this is a Carolina Crowder cowpea and you can see some of them are already some of the husks are drying out. There's been a lot of rain lately, but as they dry out, you can see the little black eyed pea starting to form in there. Third type of black eyed pea, so you can get food from this, and then it's a nitrogen fixer, of course, so we can, we're gonna be able to um, work it back into the soil, build up some nitrogen, keep the nematodes at bay for just long enough to build the organic matter because they need in order, they love the woody compost even, so you really have to use manure, green manure and regular manure to you know, bring that nitrogen level up and, and get the nematodes to at least go further down into the subsoil. So I see some uh, deciduous fruit trees here in the middle of the garden. Yeah, we had an amazing nectarine season this year, feeding the neighborhood of squirrels. And uh, we had some nice peaches as well. The nectarines, this was an amazing uh, stone fruit year for us. Exciting. Nectarines did great. And we actually, kind of in a, trying to strategize about how to get more fruit and give less to the squirrels. Because the tree's a little tall, but also the nectarines, they're so, um, they ripen such a staggered, you know, ripening rate that they, we ended up just harvesting a bunch raw and eating them like apples and they're delicious, like even, or I mean not raw, but unripe. Okay. And they're delicious, even just crunchy. Nice. So the peaches uh, did great and actually a couple days ago was our last peach season. Or I mean Ooh. our last, last uh, peach Persimmon harvest. and fig is loaded too, Persimmons huh? Persimmon's loaded, fig's loaded. It's an amazing uh, fruit year for us, yeah. Nice. There's those Mexican sunflowers you were talking about. Oh, yeah, yeah. We had a we had a little bit of an issue with predation this year. We had uh, the leaf hopper coming through and just decimating the leaf hopper beetle. Really decimated um, a lot of our greens and everything. But they've recently moved on. We did or we did bring in some ladybugs, praying mantis, and we were focusing on a predatory pests. You know, we and we had a lot of predatory wasps too, just naturally. But the ladybugs I've even seen recently just working on those aphids, so that was really satisfying. Wow, having the, nice. Trying to work with more of that and less sprays. Because even the neem oil, you don't want to overdo it on that kind of stuff. This is the uh, molakia here, Egyptian spinach. Over to right. Love, you want to show people you can eat the leaves on this? On the peach tree? No, on the oh, uh, on, on the, the molakia. Yeah. Oh my God, it's delicious. I know. I tell people yeah. all the time. Please, people, do not be scared. Actually, um, it's also an amazing soup thickener. I put some in my soup the other day, and it has the same effect as rue. You know, it just thickens it up. Nice. Um, these are delicious, and I mean, they're not even. They taste a little bit like cucumber to me. Have a that slight mucilaginous thing going on, but I love it. Juice mallow, Egyptian spinach, it's good stuff. Looks like you guys are pretty successful with papayas around here too. I know. <laughs> well, 
We grow them, we eat them, we throw them in the compost, and then they just sprout up for us. Yeah. So that's just like, we got a lot of volunteer papayas keeping us in business. Those tomatoes seem to be doing pretty good too. The tomatoes are good, yeah. The, they're in a little bit of shade with this nectarine tree. And, um, you know, every, every week, one tomato plant, I'll find some disease. And I'll try to get rid of it and get it out of the garden. Over here, you could actually see some yellow leaf curl. And I was like, oh, wow, you have so many tomato blossoms on here. I really don't feel like, but you can see when the leaf starts curling and the veins get real green and the leaf is yellow. Um, definite deficiency there. I haven't been able to figure out how to cure the yellow leaf curl, but you know, for you plant a bunch of, you plant a few rows and you'll get plenty of tomatoes even with the viruses. Nice. The cherry tomatoes do much better here uh, throughout the summer. So those are all, we got Matt's wild tomato, Galapagos uh, cherry tomato, uh, a few Everglades as well. So, I mean, summertime growing is definitely nothing easy. So what, what kind of crops are you guys having the most success with? The eggplants are taking off. You can see these cowpeas are starting to uh, take over the eggplants, but somehow these, egg, these eggplants seem to love it. I don't know if they're, you know, with all the, the shade maybe and the, a little bit of the mulch from the cowpeas, but we do a lot of eggplant. Here you see sun hemp. This is a, a green manure crop that we're using uh, to help, again, fight the nematodes. It's nematode resistant and then till the organic matter back into the soil. Uh, but we're having success with the cowpeas, the eggplants, uh, tomatoes are doing great. For now, I'm surprised the kale and the brassica family is doing so well. Uh, you can see we're growing amaranth as a green substitute for the summer, so this is great cooked. Um, also, when it's younger, raw. Even now, some of the younger, the younger shoots you can eat raw. Seminole pumpkin. Amaranth is also so beautiful. It's like, why wouldn't you want to grow that? It's, yeah, that's it has stunning. great ornamental yeah. value. Seminole pumpkins are taking off. Uh, we have some, let's see if we can find you. You can see some of these, uh, I believe these are called like tromboncini. Uh, it's a type of Italian zucchini that grows really long. I really should put some more trellising up over here for them because once they grow up, it's just really cool. You have this like hanging saxophone. It could be like a foot to two feet, uh, long zucchini. Um, so those are those grow pretty well so far through the summer. Nice. But as we move deeper into the season, we're going to focus on laying some beds fallow so we could really mulch them and build up some manure and help with the help with all of our nematode issues. Our motto here is just grow the soil. Soil will take care of the food. We don't grow food, we grow soil and then we just let it let it do its thing. I like Helping that. nature along, you know. Love all the flower integration. I think that's, yeah. you know, I mean, it's aesthetically pleasing. It's inviting. I mean, you see the butterflies flying right. through. Obviously, helping with the pests. Yes, it looks good. And a lot of the even over here, I'm growing a Tulsi crop, holy basil. Um, it's having some neighbor issues with this butternut squash, but <laughs> the holy basil puts out beautiful purple flowers. The bees absolutely love it. And then we dry this herb for tea for uh, holy basil tea. One of the most revered plants in the world and has a lot of medicinal value. Um, it's so aromatic and pleasant to even walk by. And then we got uh, one of my favorite spots here in the garden is our little uh, pond. So we got a banana grove, plantain grove, and then we got a pond here with a lot of water hyacinth and papyrus. So it's a totally closed loop system, zero waste. We have the fish, uh, tilapia in the pond, uh, fertilizing the hyacinth and the papyrus, the reeds, papyrus reeds. I mean, one of nature's greatest uh, water filters, uh, the hyacinth as well. The hyacinth is an invasive here in Florida, um, highly invasive, almost impossible to get rid of. So uh, it's also 
happens to be an amazing compost. So it's super high in nitrogen, similar to kudzu vine. It'll just set, it'll make your compost into like a hormone booster almost, you know, wow. it's amazing. So we're, we harvest this hyacinth incorporate it into our compost. And then an idea of ours is to actually get some, see maybe some environmental groups like Sierra Club or something. Uh, they go out and they clean this stuff and then they just, uh, you know, I don't know how they exactly dispose of it, but I'm thinking they probably don't compost it. And I would, uh, I think that would be a great kind of, um, win-win situation for you know the city to get on board with Sierra Club or something with us to go yeah. harvest the stuff and then compost it. Nice. I've yeah. been here four times. I didn't even know there was a pond hiding. I know here. it hides. It yeah, yeah, definitely. The bananas are kind of closing our hands. Exactly. And the bananas feed off that water. They love the water. Look at these elephant ears blowing up. Growing some mouse melon here for the first time. It's a uh, called a Mexican mouse melon and they supposedly put off just little pearls of watermelons. I'm excited about that. Got a lot of kids coming through here so I try to do some fun stuff for the kids. More Tulsi over here and we've got our flowers. You can see as we as we walk through oh, there's some bananas coming. These bananas are pretty crowded so uh, that's why we're going through and chopping uh, mature banana trees down and laying them down as compost. Um, Starting to manage those clumps. Yeah, because nice. we, we got a little, they got a little carried away. Uh, we're trying to incorporate things in the banana forest. You can see we got, you know, we got more pumpkins and butternuts planted. We got the uh, chaya, the tree spinach. So kind of incorporating, tucking away more tree-like crops that'll eventually, um, hopefully, will have more of a food forest type of area. So that's the balance here we're trying to strike is having enough sun and then enough canopy, you know, so we don't um, overcrowd. Yeah. Because this is just a, about a quarter of an acre. It works out great in the winter time when you're doing the annual veggies, all these deciduous trees are leafless, so you're getting exact great lighting. That's pretty smart. Right. What are you trellising over here? Uh, these were trellis tomatoes. Okay. I like to trellis them like grapes. And, and just fan them out for uh, maximum aeration. And um, you know, right now I just didn't have enough posts, so I'm just I, I recently took some tomatoes down here, and we're recomposting this bed. And then these tomatoes over here, they're just in that cage type of situation, which is not my favorite. I like the trellising, but it is a lot of work initially to get the trellis up. Sometimes easier to just pop the cage over. It. Nice. But you really want to be careful down here, especially in the summer with. Uh, maximum airflow for your tomatoes and everything really just because it's, it gets really moist, wet and bacteria starts to spread. We used to have the chickens, we still have a couple rabbits. Um, they're meat rabbits but really they're just for petting here. <laughs> they're like, this is more of a petting sanctuary. This is, yeah, this is more of a sanctuary. Yeah, we do use their fertilizer. <laughs> Put it in the compost. They're a little hungry right now. I've got to get them some. Uh, oh yeah, he's like, where's my bowl? I've reached the bottom of the bowl. Thanks. She's a friendly one. That's a little wild guinea pig that we found in the uh, in the garden, actually. Really? Yeah. We got a little worried that. Hey, bud. He's gonna get sniped by a hawk or something. Yeah. So. <laughs> he's little. They could get him. Yeah. So you can imagine there used to be 60 chickens roaming all around here. We had a coop up that we uh, demolished recently. As we transition towards being more of a demonstration of educational facility, we're just gonna get 10 chickens and we're gonna have a coop that's really modular, easy to build, good demonstration coop. And it's gonna be, it's gonna include an, a few hives too. So it'll be like a apiary. We have this design where there's a chimney for the bees to fly up and out. So there's no uh, bee lines for traffic. No, a lot of kids here, you know. Cool. We had a bee swarm once with all these kids. That was fun. So we're trying to avoid any potential uh, liabilities. So what are you going to do with all this rich soil? Is this going to be an add-on to the food forest? The yeah, garden? exactly. We're, we've, yeah, we've been talking. What's the best method uh, to, to get all of this kind of enriched soil back into the garden? Probably a volunteer day. <laughs> so yeah, and eventually this is going to become, uh, the city's requiring us to have a parking lot, so this is going to become a little bit of a parking lot. Uh, it's going to be that kind of parking lot that has those tiles where the grass grows through, so it'll It'll be able to absorb the rain and not have as much runoff into the sewage system, nice. you know, the stormwater system. Nice. 
take a star fruit, make it through the winter for you guys fine? Yep, definitely. And uh, it sets fruit like right about, I'd say it starts to set fruit here in um, February, March, flowers in February, March, and then again now in May. I wonder if it'll flower another time even this year, maybe three times even. It's a heavy producer. Has the tamarind set fruit for you guys too? No, no tamarinds yet. And this is, this is about that time period where anything that wasn't grafted, anything that was planted uh, from seed, should start fruiting so the tamarind and the hopefully we'll start getting some fruits from them in the next couple of years. Give me the why. What, what gets you excited? Why do you do this? Well for me I was in a place in my life where I just didn't really have any grounding, you know, and I was actually traveling in India and seeing people gardening and seeing people like get working with the earth in a way that I haven't really seen in the states because so much of the farming culture has been industrialized, you know, so people aren't quite as connected to the land. So when I saw that and started doing that, I realized what I was missing, you know, this connection to the land. It's pretty much a meditation, a therapeutic thing as well as the most basic thing you can wrap your mind around I need food like where do I get it that I can trust you know and so it starts with starts with just your own needs and you know for mental health physical health that's what being in the garden uh, for me is all about just staying healthy and then you know it's it's amazing I've just been blessed to have opportunities to to make it into an actual job you know and be able to sustain myself financially as well it's pretty amazing I know I've been I've been really lucky in that sense but I encourage people to think outside the box and you know I spent almost 10 years traveling earning my keep in different farms you know gaining experience that way it's not all about I don't have like you know a degree in this or anything so think outside the box there's a lot you can learn on YouTube and then you know just doing the dirty work getting in there How do we get involved? What's, you know, how do people come here and help in the garden, Lev? Give us a little bit of a lowdown on location and everything. Well, we'd love for you to get involved physically if you're local here and you can come down any uh, Sunday or Wednesday. We're open from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. is like an open house uh, garden volunteer day. Um, and then otherwise, check us out on Facebook, get in our newsletter, visit us online, our website. We're always, uh, it's St. Pete Eco Village on Facebook. Uh, we're always having events here, classes, workshops and tours and a lot more to come. We're building a commercial kitchen, so it's gonna be not just how to grow food, but how to cook food, and we're excited. Awesome, thanks, Lev. All right. Appreciate it, bro. Yeah, man.